Hello and welcome to Acme Science News Now. I am your host, Samuel Hansen. Over the past 20 years, uh, there's been somewhere around 2,000 new planets that have been discovered. But we are still left with a lot of fundamental questions about how those planets are formed. This is not something that's easily observable, considering that the time scale is on the order of millions of years. And also, I'm pretty sure that it's not the easiest thing to just find a planet that's in the process of being created. But now, thanks to my guest, Sally Dodson-Robinson, and her team of researchers at the University of Texas at Austin, and their new model uh, of planet formation, we have new insights into how planets are born. Professor Robinson, welcome to Acme Science News Now. Thank you. So I guess uh, the first question uh, should be a uh, basic one here. How exactly do planets actually form? Well, we think there are two ways planets can form. Number one, I call it the bottom-up approach, and what happens there is you have little microscopic dust grains floating around in the disks of gas that surround young stars, and just like dust bunnies under your bed, those dust grains start to stick together and coagulate, and eventually they grow up to be pebbles, and then the pebbles collide to make rocks, and then eventually once you get rocks that are big enough to to start gravitationally attracting one another, they can become the they can become planets. And some of those planets will become big enough, like Jupiter and Saturn, that they will get an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium. So we think that the Earth and the Jupiter and Saturn started forming in basically the same way, but Jupiter happened to get big enough to actually grab a giant atmosphere. So somewhere inside Jupiter, there's a little solid core of about 10 Earth masses. So that's our first story about how planets form. And then the second possibility is that maybe some of them actually collapse directly from these disks of, 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 of gas that surround young stars. So you just get um, a particularly dense part of the gas and it just collapses and makes a gas giant. So that's another possibility. So you have these uh, two basic ideas, hypotheses of, of how planets form. What brought about the idea of, of trying to, you know, model, model this process uh, the way that you have? Well, my thesis was actually on the chemistry of planet formation. And the reason I did that thesis is because if you want to understand how planets form, you really have to understand their birth environment. So you have to understand the conditions around them as they grow. And so my work now with the Texas Advanced Computing Center is extending those models so that we've put in some new physics, which, which is um, basically magnetic fields. So seeing what magnetic fields do to the conditions that surround growing planets, and then once we have our answer, we can determine, um, you know, in our disks of gas that surround young stars, which places are good places to form planets, which places are bad places. So it's all just um, a theme of, of really understanding the environments that produce planets. So now, now that you do have this model and, and you're able to better understand uh, these environments, as you say, what factors did you end up uh, finding out are very important to the creation of new planets? Well, one thing in our work that we found is that um, there's a region really close to the star, and that region ends up being fairly devoid of turbulence, so not a lot of turbulent activity. And that region extends to about two astronomical units from the star, which would be a little bit farther than Mars is from our sun. And in that region, you, you don't have much turbulence, which turbulence is a way to actually push, push away density, push away mass. So the mass just piles up there. So that place in the disk gets really, really dense, and that might be a very good place to form planets. Um, another thing we found is that the disk is very cold, and um, 
What we used to think with our old models is that the place where ice would freeze in the disk was somewhere out near Jupiter's orbit, but actually it's much, much closer to the star, much nearer to Mars's orbit. And so what that means is that you can get icy planets and planetesimal a lot closer to the star than we think, than we thought you could. So that's kind of exciting too. Uh, what, what sort of uh, impact do you uh, foresee for this uh, model of yours? Uh, how, how are you expecting it to, uh, uh, say, influence other scientists or, or uh, other things that you are planning on, say, building onto it? Well, my hope is that it will influence observers. A lot of the time, people who actually look at these disks where planets are forming, that they use a model of the disk in which the only energy source is the star. So basically, all that's happening in this disk is that the star is heating up the surface of the disk, and that's it. However, we do have this magnetic turbulence, and if you include that, it does change the way the disk behaves. And so I think, I, my hope is that observers will be able to use what we've calculated in order to interpret their observations better. And another thing I think we can do is um, we can test our models of magnetic turbulence in disks with a particular telescope called the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's a big collection of radio telescopes down in Chile. And um, my student, Emma Yu, is actually devising a test for our model using that telescope, where if we see something in particular, it means that our model is probably right. So I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to do that too. It's very important to me always that we test our theories and test the results of our computations. So uh, I guess, I guess this leads to the inevitable question that I somehow seem obliged to ask every single person who uh, deals with other planets that I talk to. What does this mean about the probability of us meeting an alien? Um, you know, I, I mean, we are definitely getting some insights into how planets form and what they could be made of, but I think this work has much stronger implications for things like giant planet formation. So whether or not you could, per, for example, form a Jupiter very close to the star. And a couple of years ago, I would have said, no, that's not very likely. But now I think maybe it is based on these new models. And so this has given me a different idea about how giant planets can form. And I think what's also true is that you may be able to get um, icy bodies from a much wider part of, of, the, of the disk of the solar system than, than we thought before. And so I think that's also interesting because maybe it means that, for example, the water on Earth didn't have to come from so far away. Maybe it came from actually very close to the Earth. So I think that's important, and certainly the story of, of water on Earth is important because that's one of the prerequisites for Earth-like life. But in terms of going all the way up to intelligent beings, I don't think this work ha is, is able to really contribute any insight. Well, thank you for, for so diplomatically answering my incredible, incredibly silly question. <laughs> okay. And uh, thank you, Professor Robinson, for coming on to Acme Science News Now. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.